want to introduce you to a man from my uh, last church where I was at in California for almost 20 years. His name was, don't worry, he's not here today. Um, but uh, uh, if he was here, you would completely see Frank and go, whoa. Um, Frank uh, was an interesting individual. Um, my, my last church in California was different than this church. This one's more white collar. That one was more blue collar. Uh, I, had a, I had a number of law enforcement people there, uh, federal agents, etc. But I also had a lot of former convicts there, too. Uh, so I had a wide variety of friends uh, there. Uh, one of my prisoners, uh, we went to a man's uh, a function, and a big, burly guy, huge, he's like the size of the car he got into. He got into the front of the undercover car of the captain of homicide, who was on our, el- on our elder board. And he, he got this particular guy, not Frank, but another guy, got into this car in the front seat, and the other man got in the back seat to go to a man's function. And the former convict, uh, you know, he said, uh, this is awesome. I've never been in the front seat before. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he was always handcuffed in the back. But anyway, uh, Frank. Frank was an in- interesting individual. Uh, it was a smaller church uh, and that I started when I was 31. Uh, never grew past about 270 people, 280 people. Um, and it was, uh, it was an interesting church to uh, shepherd. I learned much there. Great people. Um, but uh, when Frank came, uh, he stuck out. I, I, there were two Sunday school classes at the time. I taught the main one. There was another one. Uh, and so Frank started coming to my, I think it was the revela- study of, uh, ex- exegetical study of the book of Revelation. Uh, and uh, he, it took me about a year to do it, and so Frank came to that, and uh, he he totally stuck out from the, my typical prisoner because he's a he's a very big dude, uh, he, he, big chest, you could tell he pumped weights, uh, rippling. Uh, his arms were like Popeye's arms. I mean, his, he was huge, no neck. He'd make a great wrestler, and uh, uh, covered in tattoos. I mean, they were all down his arms, kind of demonic looking things. You could see him coming out the back of his neck, uh, so they were down his back. They were they were everywhere. Uh, but he was just an intimidating individual, didn't smile much, didn't talk much, perfect parishioner. He just kind of just was, you know, <laughs> easy to care for that sheep, but uh, just joking, Marty humor. So as I got to know Frank, um, he said a lot of interesting things to me. Uh, one of the things that he told me, because uh, I asked him one time when I got to know him, wasn't, wasn't afraid to talk to him. Uh, I said, hey, Frank, man, how, how did a guy like you in your mid-40s wind up looking like a physical specimen? And, and that's when he told me, uh, I've spent half my life in the California penal system. Oh, yeah, so what'd you do in there? Oh, I was in the weight yard all the time, lifting weights. Uh-huh, yeah, I can see that. Uh, and he was also a, a former meth dealer, uh, bad dude, ran a Hispanic gang, and a, a very scary individual. This is what he told me one time after Sunday school. He came up to me and he said, you know, he said, I've been thinking about it. He said, uh, one of the scariest things uh, that you know, I can think about in my life in prison uh, was um, with one phone call, I could kill anybody outside the prison. And he said, I'm not kidding. One phone call, and my gang would carry out whatever my desires were. And he, but uh, somewhere along the line, uh, as he was in the, in the California penal system, Fra- Frank, well, he, he became a believer. So the old Frank was gone. And now there's a new Frank, you know. Uh, But the only problem was the old Frank would kind of follow the new Frank around. You know what I'm saying? Like the old sinful life. We'll get to that in just a minute. Another day after Sunday school class, he came up to me when everybody was filing out. uh, And he, I don't know. I couldn't believe you said this to me. I still have a hard time processing what he told me. He came up to me. He's a scary individual. I mean, he just looks scary, but he's a great guy. He came up to me and he said, hey, pastor, I just wanted to just tell you this morning after class, you know, that you're one of the only people like on the planet that I allow look at me in the face when we talk. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Okay. I guess that was, a, was that a compliment? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm like, hey, thanks for the compliment. See why this was an interesting sheep to manage. I mean, it was like unbelievable. Uh, he was great. Uh, I think I did his, uh, was either his grandma or his grandfather's funeral. Uh, and when I went to the, his mom's house where he was living uh, when he got out of prison, I uh, went over there to, you know, do the preparation. It was in the worst possible part of town, and I knew it because I was the chaplain for the police department, uh, 100 officers. So I knew this part of town from police reports. <laughs> And uh, that's where his mom lived, you know. But I wasn't afraid because Frank was there. Yeah. See? But anyway, so one day I got a call, and it told me, hey, Frank's been arrested. I'm like, what in the world? I mean, because Frank was getting his life together. He left the old man behind, wasn't the drug dealer anymore, wasn't making meth, which is interesting. My dad was a federal agent who shut down meth labs. It was interesting. 
And, and so uh, he got arrested, like he was, in, he was in the county jail. I was the sheriff chaplain for, you know, the police officers out there. And, uh, and so he's, he's, in in, he's in the intake area. Uh, and so I'm like, what in the world happened to him? He's, he, was, he had a great job as a foreman at a plant near our house. He, he loved getting up in the morning and, and actually working for a living. Uh, and he wasn't hurting anybody anymore. I mean, he, I, I talked to him all the time. What happened? Uh, and so I, I got in my car. I drove about, I don't know, 15 miles out to the prison. Uh, they all knew me there because uh, I was a chaplain, so I talked to the officer on duty. They, you know, ushered me down the little corridor to where all the little rooms were, where all the, the telephones are, where the bulletproof glass is. You know the drill? And I grabbed the phone, and Frank comes in on the other side. They set him down. And uh, the first thing I told him is, hey, man, number one, I love you. And, and if I could be on the other side of the glass, that's where I'd be because I'm not afraid of you. You know, and he's like, hey, man, I appreciate that. You know, you know I wouldn't hurt you, Pastor. You know, and, uh, <laughs> and I said, we had a really interesting conversation there in that little cubicle, you know, through the black telephone. Uh, and I said, hey, man, like, what happened to you? You were going so great. And he goes, well, my past. He said, there's other gangs that don't like me because of who I used to be. And he said, while I was out working at this plant, they came into my apartment, planted dope all over the place, called the cops, they came, they know my track record, I'm on two strikes. They came in, found whatever it was, heroin, whatever, uh, and uh, then they summarily arrested me, and now I'm up for three strikes, life imprisonment. I'm like, you've gotta be kidding me. Um, and so I, so I talked to him for a while, and, uh, and I said, you know, hey Frank, you know, as you look at your family, you know, your, your siblings, your little you know, your brother, whoever, in your family, the other young men, you know, what would you tell them? Uh, I'm getting to my sermon in just a minute. Uh, he said, well, I, w- I would tell him, hey, do not do what I've done with my life. Do not make the friends that I made. Do not make the decisions that I made, you know. Um, but at the core of what Frank would be about was Christ because he was a new man. The only problem was his old life kept following him around, and he had to struggle with getting rid of the old man, as Paul, as Paul has talked about in Romans 5 and 6, and putting on the new man, living a, a new life. Um, he, he was that new man, but... Uh, he wanted to be a different man, but it was a, it was a struggle to become that new man. Now I, I would probably be remiss or get emails all day long if I didn't tell you like what happened. You know what I'm saying? So you come back next week. <laughs> this is how we get you to come to church again. No, um, actually next week I'm I'm speaking at the National Apologetics Conference in Charlotte uh, with uh, Robbie Zacharias, Chip Ingram that I went to seminary with, uh, Josh McDowell. Hugh Ross, et cetera. And I'm, I'm speaking on Saturday afternoon on is, is uh, transgenderism logical? Uh, so pray for me uh, that God will give me the words to say uh, to the 3,000 people that are coming to that thing. But anyway, uh, what was I talking about? Frank. Frank. Oh, yeah, what happened to Frank? Yeah. <laughs> See what happens when you turn 60? What was I talking about? Uh, uh, eventually, the, the police did further investigation, the detectives, blah, blah, blah. Uh, he spent some time in jail, uh, but was eventually freed. Uh, and allowed to go on and live his life. So, you know, don't worry, because uh, God's always working, even if you get arrested for something. God's always working in all that stuff. Uh, and he, he, was, he was working in his life. Now, the question was, was the, the new Frank going to leave the old Frank behind? Isn't, isn't that the question? I mean, go back to you. As, as, as you're, if you're a believer, your job is to leave the old, whatever, put your name in there. I got to leave the old you behind, and, and I got to put on the, n- the new me in Jesus, see? Uh, how do you go about doing that? Now, that's what Paul has been talking about in chapter 6, uh, the first uh, 14 verses. He's going to talk about it more in detail in the ensuing verses. How, how can you live a victorious Christian life? That's the bottom line. Whether you're a convict, former convict, what, uh, an attorney, whatever it is that you are. But if you're a believer, how do you live a victorious life? Uh, Paul says, let me point out four things to help you along that path. Number one, he says you need to understand in my, my terminology uh, when you look at verses 15 and 16, I summarize them this way. You've got to understand a key what? Principle. What's the principle? Paul says that, let me pose a question, verse 15. What shall we say in light of what I just said in the first 14 verses? That the old, your old master, sin and the devil, uh, the power of the sin and the devil in your life was broken at the moment of faith in Jesus. Now you have a new master, Jesus. What then, in light of that, shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? Remember, he's writing Jews. He's addressing the Jews in that church who are now Christians, who love the Torah. And Paul says, I've been talking about how the Torah has limitations. It can't save you. The law just tells you that's sinful. It can't redeem you. Christ can redeem you. But 
his argument has been, just because I tell you the law has limitations doesn't mean I'm anti-law, antinomian. So he's addressed two questions. Uh, if you go back to verse 1 of chapter 6, he has, an, has a question there. His opening question was, in light of the uh, eternal security that you have in Jesus in chapter 5, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? That was that argument. You know, now that I'm covered by the blood of Christ, my life is good, I'm in good standing with God, does that mean now there's so much grace from God I can sin and grace will come in and cover it? That's awesome. I can sin and be evil and God's grace will cover it. No, Paul said that is not what I said. Isn't it wonderful being a pastor of a church? Of a church? or being a teacher of biblical truth. What's going to happen to you? If you're going down that road, God's called you to be a shepherd, understand that you are going to be misunderstood. It just comes with the term. And Paul says, no, you, you misunderstood me. Uh, God didn't free you to sin more. He freed you to sin less. So now he's going to pose a different kind of question uh, in verse 15. What then shall we say, because we're not under the law, the Torah, the Old Testament, but we're under grace. Should we now do more sin then? Are we free? What's his answer? Uh, next verse, if we could see the next slide. What's he say? No. May, it never be. May it never be. Guess what? That's the same thing he said back up in chapter 6, verse 1, when he, when he asked the same kind of question. He gave the same kind of answer. In Greek, it's meganoito. It's a definitive, not happening. But he's, he's saying, just because I tell you that the law showed me my sin and led me to the Savior doesn't mean that I'm against law. But I see its limitations. But the law can't save but just because I tell you that's limitations doesn't mean that I, uh, as a grace-filled guy, a great guy who understands the grace of God, think that you're free to go live a wicked lifestyle. No, I never said that. So Paul wants to correct their thinking, which then leads to how you live a victorious life under this first principle. What's the principle? Verse 16 is the principle to victorious living. What is it? Do you not know? He asked them a question. And the implication here is, you as Jews should totally understand this. Do you not know that uh, when you uh, present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of whom you obey? You have two options. Either to who? Sin, resulting in death, thanatos, physical or spiritual death, or of obedience resulting in righteousness. You have two options. Uh, he says if you're a Christian, the principle is you're obedient to whoever your master is. Well, if I'm not a Christian, who's my master? Sin is my master. Who's the other master, really? The devil. Remember him? Satan. He's the, he's the ultimate master. So when I didn't know Christ and I was born into Adamic sin, remember chapter 5? We're all born under the sin of Adam. We can't escape it. Uh, he's our federal head. When he bit the dust, we all bit the dust with him. We're all born sinners, that whole thing. Well, but, but when you are living under the reign of the first Adam and don't know the second Adam, Jesus, by faith... Well, then you, you just live that godless life in domination, obedience to that master. You don't even give God a thought. But he says on the other side of the equation, if you obey Christ, you're his slave. You're a slave of somebody. You're either a slave of sin and the devil or you're a slave of Christ. He said if you're a Christian, you should be a slave of Christ. Now, he's using a slavery motif, which is positive-negative connotation. Negative. Why? Well, it's negative even today. Because even in the Roman Empire, it was run by slaves. Uh, and there's slaves in that Roman church that he's writing to. And he's basically saying, if anybody gets the concept of slavery, it's the Roman Empire. That's how they run. So let me explain walking with God in newness of life based on a motif you both understand as free man and as slaves. Uh, it's all the concept of slavery. Whoever you obey, that's your master. Uh, the ancient history encyclopedia says this about Roman slavery. Quote, Slaves were the lowest class of society in Rome, and even a freed criminal had more rights. Slaves had no rights at all. In fact, no legal status or individuality. They could not create relations or have a family, nor could they own any property. To all intents and purposes, they were merely the property of a particular owner, just like any other piece of property, a building, a chair, or a vase. The only difference was they could speak. To be a slave in the Roman Empire meant they owned you. Paul says, well, think about this. You who understand slavery. You who might be in that church and be a slave. But now you've been freed and you, you worship Christ. Who's your master? Well, when you don't know Christ, who's your master? We've already covered this. This is review. Satan and sin. Once I become a believer, I'm justified by my faith in the personal work of Jesus Christ. 
Who's my master? Christ is my master. So if I want to live a victorious life, I understand I am freed from the old man, the old Frank, and I'm free to be the new man. Question is, do you live like you're free to follow Jesus? If you're a Christian, does your life reflect the fact that you're free from the old man? Second thing he says, verses 16 and, uh, and following, we just discussed, verses 17 and 18, he says, if you want to live a life uh, that, that shows the greatness of grace and godly living, understand your position, that I call it a key position. Notice what he says. But thanks be to God, that though you were slaves um, uh, to sin, you became obedient from the heart of that form of teaching which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, notice the cause-effect relationship, you became slaves of righteousness, the effect. When I was released from my sinful captivity in 1967 when I trusted Christ as my Savior as a nine-year-old, what happened on that day? I traded masters. Sin and the devil weren't going to be my master. Now it was the master Christ. And that day you're freed, he says, you became a slave of righteousness that day. You're equipped to live a righteous life. Now, you can't say it's too early in the morning to talk about grammar because it was early in the morning at 8 this morning to talk about grammar. You are totally awake, are you not? Mm-hmm. So <laughs> you're not lying, right? That's another sin we might need to address, okay? What in the world are talking about grammar? Why is the grammar important? Because the Word of God is inspired down to the crossing of a T and the dotting of an I. So if God chose an active or a passive tense for a verb, that may mean nothing to you. It means everything. So when you look at the two verbs here at the end of verse 18, he uses two passive tense verbs. Having been freed, one, you became slaves, two. Two passive tense verbs. What does that mean? Here's what it means. If it's an active verb, the subject's doing the acting. Okay, so the, okay, that doesn't help me. What's that mean? If it's an active ten, tense verb, it means you yourself freed yourself from sin to be saved. Good theology, bad theology. Heresy. No. Uh, and it would mean that you, you made yourself a slave of righteousness on your own if it's, a, if it's an active sense. But it's a passive voice. What's that mean? Subjects being acted upon. What's that mean? That means God himself, when he saved you, he freed you, not you. You didn't free yourself. And when he freed you, he made you his slave unto righteous, godly living. It's all that he did. That's all the grammar we're going to talk about. Praise God, moving on. Point, <laughs> point two. Uh, Paul says you were slaves to sin. Okay, you have three options. Basically. Past tense, present tense, future tense. It's not future and it's not present. Excellent choice. It's, it's in the past. You were slaves to sin. I, I just need to ask you a, a practical point. Do you remember, if you're a Christian, when you were not saved? Do you, do you remember? We have three Christians here this morning. Um, do you remember when you, do you remember? He said, you were slaves to sin. I remember. I can totally remember. I might have been nine, but I had issues at nine. Didn't you? If you don't believe, ask your mother. She'll tell you. <laughs> Unbelievable. Oh, I could tell you stories. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I mean, my mom, yeah. She, she's going to be here in about three weeks. She's looking to move here. Uh, so, yeah, so either here or Nashville where my sister is going to move, so my little sister. So, uh, anyway, pray for my mom when she shows up and wax eloquent when she comes so she moves here. But anyway, <laughs> she's probably watching this service going, Marty. But anyway, uh, uh, back to what we need to talk about. Um, <laughs> You were slaves to sin. It, that's the old you. Get this through your head. The old you is old news. You didn't hear me. The, the old you is old news. The old Frank is old news. So when, so when the devil would come to Frank and say, you're just a loser. You spent 20 years in the California penal. Uh huh? Well, a loser. You're throwing your life away, man. No, 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 no. In Jesus, he's, in, he's what? That's old you. Old you. No, you're, they're, you're, you're the new person in Christ. Do you, do you recognize that? Do you recognize who you are as a believer and understand the old you? Paul understood the old him. Uh, he talks about it in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13. These are passionate words written toward the end of his life, not, not too long before he was executed, as he writes these, these books, uh, these letters. Notice what he says here. Even though I was formerly a what? Blasphemer. Blasphemeo in Greek means to say mean, hurtful things. If anything, our culture has got the corner on blasphemeo. <laughs> Don't they? Are you kidding me? Can't they talk nice anymore? Well, they're in bondage to sin and Satan. But anyway, back to my sermon. I was formerly a blasphemer and, tack on, persecutor. persecutor. 
Well, what kind of persecutor? Well, violent aggressor. I didn't just verbally come after you as a, as a guy lost in Pharisaical Judaism. If you were a, a Jew who converted to Christianity, I arrested you. We beat you. We incarcerated you. We executed you. I led that. Could you imagine as a side point hiring him at your church to work there? I'm just saying, because we're looking at resumes right now of guys applying for the, t- the youth job we've got and senior high and the, you know, and, and the youth uh, music job. And could you imagine if the resume came something like, yeah, well, my former life, you know, I beat people up. I, I put them in prison if they were Christians. I executed them. But yeah, I'd love to work at your church. <laughs> eh. See, it sounds, it's unbelievable. That was your former life. Excellent. Yeah. And so he said, that was the, my, my former life. I was violent. Now, now what's the next word? Other f- yet. Aren't you glad God put a yet in your life? Amen. Yet what? I, Paul, I was shown what? Mercy. Mercy. What is our culture forgot about? Mercy. Mercy. We are the most ruthless, mean-spirited people, and the people who say they're not ruthless and mean-spirited are the ones who are ruthless. I mean, it's unbelievable. What does Paul say? God showed me who was mean and ruthless mercy mercy because i acted in ignorantly in unbelief when i wasn't a christian and the grace of our god of our lord was more abundant it covered my sin uh, with faith and love which are found in christ jesus it is a trustworthy statement deserving a full acceptance what that christ jesus came into the world to save who sinners sinners and then he throws in well uh, among whom i am the foremost of all you couldn't get more of a sinner than me. Note, what's the next word? Oh, it doesn't show it yet? Verse 16. Is it up there? What's the next word? Yet. 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 For this reason I found mercy, so that in me, as the foremost of sinners, you know, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Jesus used me as an example. He saved me. Here's the argument. If he can save Paul, guess what? He can save you. He can save you. And you can, at that moment of salvation, leave the kingdom of the devil and sin and enter the kingdom of Christ and live a godly life. Paul says, I remember the old me. Do you remember the old you? Paul says, that's not me anymore. Remember, the old you is what? Old news. You want to say that with me? The old me is old news. Next point. Uh, Paul says, you need to understand a key proposition to move on to greater holiness. Here's what he says. It's really a commanding in the Greek text. He says, for I am speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. Translated, this is an apology. I am sorry I have to use the illustration of slavery to to teach you about the wonders of who your master is, but it works. That's what he's basically saying. For just as you presented your members as slaves to what? Impurity and to what? Lawlessness, antinomianism, anti-law. And if you live a lawless life, he says, that results in further lawlessness. So now on the flip side, as a Christian, present your members as slaves to righteousness. What's the result? Well, it results in sanctification. For when you were slaves to sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Why? You didn't even think about living a righteous life. Why? Because you were a slave to sin. That's what you thought about. This is a key proposition. What's the proposition? That I now, who am freed from sin, the old Frank's gone, now I can choose to live the new Frank in Christ. What's that? That's a righteous, holy life. Different. But Paul says, remember your former life. You you went after two things. The first one is impurity. The second one is lawlessness. The word for impurity uh, has uh, has an alpha, a, 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 attached to the, the word. When you take the alpha and you attach it to a word, staple it together like they do in German when you do that, um, it negates the word. So if it's positive, it makes it the antithesis of that. So this is the root form for the word cathartic. But if you put an alpha on the front of it, it means it's the opposite of that. So what's catharsis mean? So you went and you got a massage. It was awesome. It was an hour and a half. Was it cathartic? Why are you so quiet? You ate a half gallon of ice cream after church. You felt led to do that. Did it feel cathartic? Oh, it was awesome. Yeah. It's cathartic. It's purifying. Uh, you confess something. You got it off your heart and your mind. You just felt cathartic. I mean, it's, it's purifying. Certain things are purifying. He, he says this is the antithesis of that. So what's the opposite of cathartic? Well, putrefaction. Impure. 
This is why this is one of the main words in the New Testament for illicit sexual activity. Again, our culture is totally, everything's permissible in our culture. No, Paul says, you used to live in, in an impurity. It's the, it's the word for any kind of sexual activity outside of marriage between a real man and a real woman. You understand me? A real man and a real woman. That's how God set it up, Genesis chapter one and two. He says, you used to live an illicit life of pursuing things that are outside what God designed for men and women. Remember that? And then he said, this was a lawless life. And, and your lawless life led to other lawless things. So how does it work? If I commit this particular sin here, then I rationalize it, and then it becomes this sin here. Well, you know, I just started out with this magazine, you know, in eighth grade, and then the magazine, well, that, I graduated from that to this, to this, to that, and, and blah, blah, blah. And no, it's just one sin leads to the other sin. Just ask King David. One sin leads to the next sin. What's, are, what are you supposed to be doing as a Christian? The opposite. I don't have to live that way anymore, lawless. Now I want to live lawful. I listen to what God says. I measure my life against that. And as I put my life in line with his life, everything's good. <laughs> you ever use a laser level? Do you know what they are? They are awesome. Because when you hit the little button and the laser shoots everywhere, you can see what is straight and what is not. And if you turn that thing off and go, I'm just going to eyeball this thing, what's going to happen? Your tile job is going to be all off. See, you know, Paul says when you, when you meet Jesus, he's the ultimate laser level for relationships, for sexuality, for marriage, for everything. And when you come to him, you can now see I'm free from sin and being lawless and now put my life in light of him and measure my life in light of what he says and then there's peace and happiness and what he calls, well, holiness. He says this kind of living results in sanctification. Sanctification, there's a word you probably use every day. Sanctification. Uh, there's two ways to look at it. Positional and progressive. Positional, 1 Corinthians 1.30. That when you become a believer, he gives Jesus, gives you his, sanct his holiness. He clothes you in it. So that if you got saved and two minutes later walked out and got hit by a car and you get up the pearly gates and Peter says, why should you come in? You can say, check out the clothing. I got the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But what's God concerned with? Well, he's concerned with your progressive sanctification. That is what Paul talks about in Colossians 3, verses 8, 13. You need to put off the old man and put on the, the new man righteousness not what i want god what do you want from me is that your life that leads to holiness and paul says let me uh close out with like a a promise that hopefully will motivate you to strive for holiness he says understand a key promise and i had to memorize part of this when i became a new christian here's what paul says let me summarize my argument therefore what benefit were you deriving from the things of which you were now ashamed I mean, he says, when you think back to your life before you were a Christian, I mean, don't you agree now as a Christian that things you did are shameful? I'm even, I even wonder that I'm alive. If you look back at some of the things that you did, are they not shameful? Sure they are. He says, for the outcome of those things is what? Death. What death? Uh, thanatos, physical death and spiritual death. But notice the word here, the, tr the transition, the contrast. But now having been freed from sin, your old taskmaster, and a slave to God, what do you get? What do you get? You derive your benefit. What benefit? Well, I get holiness. I didn't have that before. And I get the outcome is eternal life. When do you get eternal life? Only when you see Jesus? Right then. Right then. Right then. You ever been with a believer when they walk into God's presence? I have many times in my family. Uh, with my dad, uh, he died right at 6 o'clock on a Friday afternoon. Brain cancer got him. Where was he at 6.01? <laughs> In presence of God. Isn't that awesome? The body's the shell. They had that eternal life already. They just now realized it. What a benefit. Paul basically says, if you think about your old life, when you used to follow sin and Satan, you were not happy and you knew it. Trade wives and get your fifth one. Are you still going to be happy? I had a lady come in my office one time. She was sat down with her husband. She handed me this multi-page document, and she said, read this. This is all the reasons why I want to divorce my fifth husband. <laughs> Did you hear me? Do you think number six made her happy? No. no. Paul's saying, you could go on ten husbands. It's not going to make you happy, etc. Paul says, you weren't happy when you lived that lifestyle. You only find peace 
in the inner man when you come to know Christ. You know, how do you live a holy life? Well, kind of like what Frank was doing. What was this chapter? Putting off the old man, daily putting on the new man, leads to holiness. May that be all of us. It's a daily struggle, is it not? Because there's many temptations. Might God help us to be the church that puts off the old and puts on the new? And he says here in the last part, for the wages of living a sinful lifestyle is what? Death. Notice the but. But the free gift is what? Eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. It only comes, it only comes in him. A friend of mine taught a Bible study fellowship for years. Um, she's now retired. She taught 500 women every Thursday, I think it was, in California. Uh, one day she put a giant, beautiful, beautifully wrapped package on the stage, beautiful bow and everything, and she wrote on the package a, a sticker, and it said, this, this present's free for the taking. 500 ladies showed up. You think anybody took the gift off the stage? Not a one. She used it as part of her message that day to say, this is like the gospel. It's been paid for. It's wonderful. Free for the taking. What excuses are you making for not taking it? So my other message to you is if you've never taken the free gift of salvation, Christ presents it to you and says, will you take this? He paid for it. Wise people wise up and say, Satan shall not be my master. It shall be Christ. They take the gift. Might you do that? Let's pray. Father, we uh, adore you. Uh, thank you for the scriptures that uh, give us light and insight into your mind and your things. Might our lives uh, measure up to what you say is holiness, not what we say is. And might our lives put away the old man and put on the new man in righteousness. Uh, might we be lights to those in our culture that need to see the gospel on display. Give us victory in that area. And for those among us uh, who are still uh, have uh, sin and Satan as their master, might they have a wake-up call this morning and see the glory and the wonder of the free gift of grace. In Christ's name, amen.